All right, we are getting you set for this weekend in college football. We've got Dennis Dodd and Barton Simmons to help us out. Uh, so, Dennis, let's start with you. The SEC game of the week is South Carolina and Alabama. What are the storylines to watch here? Well, for South Carolina, it's Ryan Holinsky, the uh, really become a folk hero at South Carolina. He's the brother of Tyler, Tyler Holinsky, who committed suicide at Washington State a couple of years ago and, and came to South Carolina because he said – his parents told me, his uh, Tyler talked to uh, Ryan and said, you need to go to South Carolina. The parents have re relocated there. He started against Charleston Southern at a fine game, but takes a step up in competition, guys. I think we know that against Alabama, which goes on the true road for the first time. Uh, Tua Tagliavoa, obviously, is just purring along as he did last year. Not much opposition expected, I think, from South Carolina. And uh, Barton, we've got you here to help us make picks. And obviously Alabama, not a whole lot of value on the money line, but do you think they cover as 26-point favorites? I mean, I, I think that more than likely they do. And part of the reason is, I mean, yes, uh, Ryan Holinsky is a talented quarterback, but he's not super mobile. And I think that this is a, an Alabama team that's uh, going to be able to get after him, going to be able to give him some difficult looks. Um, certainly a bigger challenge than he had against Charleston Southern. And I think this South Carolina defense, you know, they got picked apart by Sam Howell a couple weeks ago. I think Tua Tonga Vailoa is going to be able to have his way with them as well. So, you know, I really like Alabama to, to win this game, certainly. And, and, and I actually would lean Alabama covering slightly as well. All right, so Alabama covering there on the game of the week, kickoff 3.30 on CBS. Next up, Ohio State takes on Indiana. And, Dennis, when we talk storylines, of course, Justin Fields, First year he stepped in at quarterback, looked great. And Ryan Day, 2-0, uh, replacing Urban Meyer, again, against a 2-0 Hoosiers here. Yeah, this was an Indiana team that gave Ohio State fits last year. It was about the time that they played them that the defense became questionable. And then we saw what happened in the upset to Purdue later in the season. I, I don't think we'll see that this week. Uh, we're still seeing the, you know, the full you know, the full development of Justin Fields. He's got nine touchdowns, nine total touchdowns in two games, same as Jalen Hurts, and has done it very quietly against suspect competition. So J.K. Dobbins is, is on a roll. This Ohio State team, with what Michigan did against Army, and I don't want to bring them into the fold, but with what Michigan did against Army, Ohio State kind of nudging ahead in the Big Ten. I don't expect much resistance against Indiana. All right, Barton, another example where we're almost positive we know which side is going to win, but do you think Ohio State can cover the 15 points? Look, uh, when Ohio State has had some success against – I'm sorry, when Indiana's had some success against Ohio State, um, remember a couple years ago when, when it was a uh, first half, Indiana was, was right there in the game, and a lot of that was due to just sort of big plays on the perimeter – I think with this Indiana team, Michael Penix at quarterback, a, a, an athletic guy who can make plays with his arm and his legs, but is a little bit more turnover prone, I, I lean Ohio State to win big here. As long as they show up with their eyes open on a noon kick and are ready to play, uh, I've been very encouraged by the way Justin Fields has taken care of the football. I think that defense can really rally around the ball for Ohio State and make things difficult. Uh, on the quarterback at Indiana and, and on that really good running game that they've got with the stable of backs. Uh, I just don't see them being being able to move the ball effectively and take care of the ball effectively. Again, as long as Ohio State doesn't turn it over, i got a hard time seeing Indiana keep pace. Buckeyes have looked impressive. Barton Simmons expects them to continue to roll in another noon kickoff. Next up, another SEC team in Georgia taking on a Sunbelt team in Arkansas State. There was a CBS preview uh, before the season that said Arkansas State, actually the best football team in Arkansas. Dennis, do you think it looks like it on Saturday? Yeah, but they're not playing Arkansas State. They're playing for something bigger a week later against Notre Dame. Maybe they can win the state of Arkansas. But I was at, our, at Georgia this week, and Kirby Smart did his darndest to tell his players and tell the media through little codes not to talk about Notre Dame. He said Arkansas State is one of the best teams he's seen. He praised the Sun Belt. He praised Blake Anderson, which he should, the inspirational coach from the Red Wolves who's come back after the death of his wife from cancer. But this isn't going to be much. This is lined up to be a perfect setup for Notre Dame. Look at the three teams Georgia's played to get to this spot. They, this is the, the first top 10 game, and I'm, again, I'm projecting to Notre Dame, at Georgia since 1946. So they'll get past Arkansas State 
and move on quickly. Jake Fromm got out quickly last week against Murray State, throwing only 11 passes. All right, uh, Barton, earlier in an SEC pick, you had Alabama covering a huge spread. What do you think here about Georgia? They're 33-point favorites. Yeah, I mean, the number I, I think is about right. I would lean Arkansas State covering this. This feels like a 30-31 point kind of win here by Georgia because, look, Notre Dame is on the horizon. And, and while they're going to be motivated um, to, to really put together a, a, a complete performance, I think Arkansas State as well is, is, is one of the more talented group of five teams you're going to find. So uh, they're going to be clawing at the end of the game and, and perhaps kicking that back door. So I think Georgia never going to sweat this one, always going to have it under control. But Logan Bonner, the quarterback for Arkansas State, has got the ability to make some plays. And, and I think that given that uh, they're going to want to get out of this thing healthy and, and, and prepared for Georgia, or for Notre Dame rather, uh, I think there's a real opportunity for Arkansas State to, to cover the big number. All right, Barton, they're picking the Red Wolves to cover the 33-point spread at noon Eastern kickoff on Saturday. All right, next up is USC, the team that beat Stanford last week against BYU. This is on the road, though, uh, Dennis. And, you know, Kedon Slovis, who thought that we were talking about that uh, quarterback there for USC? Of course, JT Daniels goes out with the ACL. This feels like a very Trojan-heavy uh, storylines in terms of the matchup here. It absolutely is. As of two weeks ago, Casey, I'd never seen USC as a school more down than they were. Questions with football, multiple scandals on the school side. Yesterday, they get, well, resign, quote unquote. Lynn Swan resigns. And all of a sudden, everything's looking up. Yes, the new AD is going to have to make a decision on Clay Helton. But guess what? The Trojans are 2-0. and Keaton Slovis has come in and, as I mentioned, rallied things back against Stanford. He's got a loaded set of receivers with Tyler Vaughn, Michael Pittman, uh, Am 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 Ammon St. Ra. Ammon Ross St. Brown, excuse me, uh, one of the best set of receivers in the country. And they go to BYU, which is coming off one of their biggest wins of the independent era at Tennessee. The legend that is Zach Wilson. I don't know if he can stand up to, uh, to USC. I want to say this is a shootout, but I also want to say that USC maybe goes for 30 or 40 in this game because I think they're on a roll. Yeah, it's hard to predict, right? So Dennis can go either way on this one, Barton. Uh, what say you, of course, can Keaton Slovis do it again? The true freshman there, four and a half point favorites on the road. I think he's the key. Uh, it, it felt like an injection of just oxygen into the room for USC. Slovis took over. And, and if, if USC had just survived against Stanford and JT Daniels was still the quarterback, I think I'd be sitting here saying BYU is about to pull the upset. But it feels like it's new life for USC. Uh, Keaton Slovis completed 85% of his passes last week, really ignited and, and uh, activated that really talented wide receiver group that Dennis talked about. Uh, I, I think that this USC team continues to get back on track, shows signs of life here, and, and wins by uh, you know, 10, 15 points because I think that we're starting to mm. see that offense come to life and keep it rolling. Barton Simmons predicting a win and a cover for USC. They would be 3-0. Heading into the Utah game the week after that would be very interesting. All right, next up is Clemson. They're taking on Syracuse. And, Dennis, some of the air was taken out of this with Syracuse absolutely dominated against Maryland last week. Still, though, this matchup packed with storylines. Yeah, uh, Syracuse getting ready for Clemson. Uh, a wounded Syracuse, certainly not as good as they were last year. But I'm told the first sellout in the Carrier Dome for a game like this in two decades. They're waiting for, obviously, number one Clemson, who comes off a rather workmanlike 24-10 to 10, uh, win over Texas A&M. I was there, and the, my takeaway was Clemson's defense, which was supposed to be less than what it was last year. I'll tell you what, they can run as fast as that team last year, and they came off the edge for Kellen Mond all afternoon. Watch Tanner Muse, a big rangy safety, who may have All-America, All-ACC you know, prospects out there. He was fantastic. Sir, I don't know what to say about Syracuse. 63 points to Maryland. There's a national story developing there with Mike Loxley, but they give up 63 to Maryland. Things don't look good going into Clemson. Trevor Lawrence ran for one and threw for one against the Aggies. He wasn't the story once again. This time it was Lynn J. Dixon, backup tailback, who led in rushing over Travis Etienne. It looks like, to me, that Clemson is going to roll. 
And Barton, despite what Dennis just said, 27 and a half points is a big number. And we know Syracuse has played Clemson tough in the past. And we know Trevor Lawrence has already thrown as many, almost as many interceptions in this short season as he did all of last year. Have I made a good enough case here? What's that, Ian? No, I think it's a compelling case, honestly. I mean, this is a Clemson team that struggled with Syracuse. They're going to the Carrier Dome, always a tough place to play. You could make a case that Clemson was overlooking Maryland uh, with the, I'm sorry, that uh, Syracuse rather was overlooking Maryland with Clemson on the horizon. Um, I think now that this game is here, uh, we're going to really see what both teams are about because, look, Clemson has just looked okay on offense by Clemson standards. Um, and that's a high bar, certainly. Uh, but this is an opportunity for Trevor Lawrence to get loose, uh, really flex his muscles against a defense that really struggled against Maryland. I think this Syracuse team is really missing Eric Dungy, their quarterback from last year, who was a playmaker through the air and on the ground and a really a big leader in that locker room and on the field. Tommy DeVito taking his time at the quarterback position to really get going. Uh, while I could see either side of this, I lean Clemson really flexing, stretching out, and, and showing that this offense is going to be as explosive as last year's. And, and I think that they go on the road in conference and uh, and get a little retribution for a couple of uh, – a close one and a loss uh, to this uh, Syracuse team. Okay, so despite my case, we are leaning – didn't sound like a hard lean, just a slight lean to Clemson to cover uh, that number on Saturday night. All right, let's stay in the SEC. We had Georgia. Now we've got an SEC matchup of Florida and Kentucky. Obviously, Dennis, the storylines begin with the rematch. Kentucky with the big upset last year over the Gators. Yeah, and that's revenge for Florida. Obviously, this isn't the same Kentucky team that uh, that beat Florida last year on its way to a 10-win season. And Florida's a little bit of a question mark itself. They're going to be missing Cardarius Tony, the receiver. I think he's got a shoulder C.J. Henderson, an ankle. I don't think it makes any difference against Kentucky. Terry Wilson, the quarterback, is out for the time being. This is just a different Kentucky team. I don't know if we know a lot about Florida. Certainly, they hung on against Miami and then beat up UT Martin last week. But I still want to see more out of Florida, especially defensively. And which way, by the way, is Felipe Franks going? Yeah, Dennis makes a great point here, Barton. We're not quite sure what to think of Florida because they looked – iffy against Miami, but looked great against UT Martin. What do you think is eight and a half point favorites in this spot? Look, I, I think when you're catching more than a touchdown at home is Kentucky, a team that beat Florida last year. Uh, that's a tempting line for me. And, and I think that Florida likely wins this game. Uh, but you got to keep in mind, you know, Terry Wilson's departure certainly hurts this team from a leadership standpoint. That guy's been integral on and off the field for this program. But Sawyer Smith is a quality backup, a guy that had success uh, at Troy and, and, and really had some, some good moments last week, even in relief. Uh, so I think that this Kentucky team is, is you know, they have a physical offensive line. Uh, where Florida's a little bit banged up and, and, and has, has lost C.J. Henderson in the secondary. Got to play a true freshman there. I just think that there's opportunity here for Kentucky, who probably hadn't shown his full hand at this point either, uh, to step in there and, and, and if not pull the upset, at the very least keep this game close and, and competitive through four quarters. So, you know, to me, I feel like this is going to be a close game, and Kentucky proves that its uh, last year was no fluke as they continue to be a competitive team in the SEC East. All right, so the underdog covering at least, according to Barton, maybe back-to-back -back years with an upset. All right. In the ACC as well, you got Florida State and Dennis. It was a win that kind of felt like a loss last week. And then Virginia, who looks like maybe the second best team behind Clemson there in that conference. Yeah, Virginia, if they win the Coastal this year, will be the seventh different team to win that division. And they certainly look like the class of it now. If you had to go for a matchup right now, you'd go for the preseason All-American Bryce Hall at corner against Tamari and Terry, who's Florida State's best receiver. But that that's not the story. Look. Florida State and Willie Taggart are the story. They've blown consecutive at home to start the season, 18-point lead and a 17-point lead at halftime at home. There's something wrong, among other things, with that Florida defense. They are getting gassed in the second half, and you can talk all you want about uh, hydration and deflect that. There's something wrong fundamentally with Florida State in the second half. James Blackman's had a pretty good season, the quarterback so far through two games. 
But it's a step up in competition, big time going on the road. I like Virginia to, to really get after Florida State this week. All right, so Barton, it sounds like Dennis is backing Virginia here to cover that seven and a half point spread. I guess the question is, how down are you on the Seminoles? What do you think happens Saturday night? Look, Virginia is the better team. Um, they've got the better quarterback. Uh, they've got the better coached team. They're more disciplined. But Virginia will get in a slog from time to time. I mean, they're not the type of team that's going to blow your doors off. And I think that in some ways, Florida State really benefits from getting away from Tallahassee. I mean, there's a little bit of a negative vibe in that program right now at home, and, and, and everyone is very disappointed. Well, now they get to get on the road uh, and, and get into a, a foreign environment where maybe they can sort of be the underdogs again here. And, and they've been playing as the favorites for a couple of weeks now. I think that this Florida State team doesn't win. I think Virginia is, is too good to lose this game. But I think that this is a team that could cover, show some signs of life because of the athleticism. Uh, this is an interesting game, and, and I think Florida State covers the 7.5 in a loss. That really would be something if Florida State was to cover, but still a loss there according to our Barton Simmons in the ACC. Next up, Iowa State and Iowa. Dennis, there were a lot of high hopes for Brock Purdy, the quarterback there after what he showed last year, but really shaky start with a narrow win over UNI. On the flip side, you got the Hawkeyes who have looked great to a 2-0 start. What storylines are you watching here? Yeah, the Cyhawk Trophy. This is always a big regional rivalry game. It takes on some national implications. Now that Iowa State is a bit of a national story because of Matt Campbell and his sexiness as a new coach somewhere. Brock Purdy, you mentioned it as a freshman last year, had Iowa State playing for the Big 12 lead as a true freshman. They didn't win it, obviously, but they're considered one of the top teams in the Big 12. Now, the I Iowa has Nate Stanley. By the time this season is over, he should be the all-time leader in touchdown passes, passing a guy named Chuck Long. Uh, I think the key to this game, again, is Purdy getting out of the pocket. The observers up at Iowa State said that was the problem against Northern Iowa. He wasn't a runner. He was a pocket passer. And against that aggressive Iowa defense, that's going to have to make the difference. A.J. Espinessa, through two games, only has one sack. So that's going to be a key matchup. So, Barton, do you think Iowa State shows some fight? Maybe it was just first game jitters? Or do you think the Hawkeyes come in and cover that two-point spread? I don't know what to call it, whether it's first game jitters, first game conservative play, um, what have you. But but I, I do think Iowa State's capable of winning this game. And, and Northern Iowa really tried to, uh, to to really sit back and make Iowa State dink and dunk them and, and, and play, uh, you know, close to the vest. And I think I was probably going to take the same game plan, um, not allow the big plays in the passing game. They're certainly capable of that. But Iowa State has had two weeks to prepare for this. They were off last week. I really think that that week one game was, was a little bit of an anomaly. And, and I think that when you look at Brock Purdy's ability to make plays, Dennis mentioned his ability with his legs, the way he can be dynamic. I think you're going to see a young running backfield led by Brees Hall, a true freshman, take a step forward. And, and I always got some playmakers now, and, and A.J. Epinesa leads the, leads the group. But I really believe that this Iowa State team is going to prove to us that they are for real. This game is in Ames. This is a great opportunity for them to pull an upset and make a statement. Uh, I think Iowa State wins the rivalry. Okay, Barton Simmons predicting the Cyclones there would be a great uh, opponent for them to prove it to us against in Iowa there in state rivals. All right, and finally, we've got Arizona State against Michigan State. And, Dennis, we had the revenge narrative earlier with Kentucky and Florida. I'm sure that uh, leads the storylines here for this matchup. Yeah, this is huge revenge narrative. If you remember last year, Michigan State going out to the desert in 100-yard temperatures, 100-degree temperatures in week two or three, as I recall, and lost a close game at the end with Herm Edwards. And that game, to me, proving he could be a college coach after all those years away. They controlled the clock. They controlled the ball. They matched up physically with a Big Ten team. And it wasn't a good look for the Big Ten or Michigan State. Now, we know how Michigan State went last year. Uh, Question all over the line with, with injuries to quarterback, receiver, offensive line. Brian Lewerke is back, the quarterback, fully healthy. They're at home. No more 100-degree temperatures to worry about. Arizona State has struggled a little bit here in the first two weeks. I think the revenge motive is huge. I really like Michigan State to take out Arizona State. 
Barton, the Sun Devils may have struggled a bit, but Jaden Daniels, the true freshman quarterback, has looked impressive. Still, Vegas has Sparty as double-digit favorites. Who do you think uh, covers the spread here? Jaden Daniels has been outstanding. Uh, he hadn't turned the ball over. He's kind of been the bright spot of that Arizona State offense. The problem here is the Arizona State offensive line hasn't really been holding up its end of the bargain. Kent State and Sac State are not Michigan State. And, and when you can't really move the pile uh, against those teams, uh, I'm not going to expect you to do it against a team that has given up negative six yards rushing on the season. That's what Michigan State's defense is doing. And, and while I think Jaden Daniels will still find some yardage through the pass game, and Eno Benjamin is certainly capable of making some plays in the run game, uh, I, I just think this two defense is too stout to lose. That said, 13 points seems like a lot of points. And I think Arizona State is capable of keeping this thing close. It's going to be a competitive four-quarter game that probably goes under the number, but I think Michigan State wins a tight one. This is not a slate packed with cupcakes. Cannot wait for this weekend in college football. That's Dennis Dodd and Barton Simmons with the breakdown. All right, next up, maybe the best team in Florida, according to the record at least, is UCF. And Dennis, I think the quarterbacks sort of lead the storylines for me at least. No KJ Costello last weekend in a loss for Stanford. And of course, UCF has multiple QBs there to turn to. Yeah, it's really a mystery at UCF now. Dylan Gabriel was a surprise starter last week um, where there was a, an injury to the starter and, and Coach Josh Heupel didn't really describe what it was, what it was with Brandon Wimbush. And it still remains a mystery who is going to start this week against Stanford. And by the way, for UCF, this is their game. This is their big power five statement that they're going to make to try to get back into a new year six uh, group of five golden ticket bowl game. They have to win this game. Stanford wounded again uh, at quarterback with Davis Mills coming out last week against, not coming out, but playing against USC. Got him up 17 to three, but the phenomenon that is USC stormed back to win that game. Stanford going cross country. I think you've got to like UCF in this game with the heat in the game that they absolutely have to win if they want to entertain chances of getting back to that big bowl. And Barton, we'll see if K.J. Costello does return, but right now his Stanford Cardinal seven-point dogs against UCF on the road. Who you got? Look, even if K.J. Costello is back under center, I think Stanford is in a real existential crisis right now. I mean, they, they don't really have an identity anymore. That physical defense is no longer there, giving up 38 to, to USC. The offense can't run the football like it used to. Walker Little, they're – all-American, first-round draft pick, left tackle is injured. Uh, this is just not a team that I feel like has known who they are for a couple of years now. And, and now you go across country, as you mentioned. They go play a UCF team that absolutely knows who they are. This is a team uh, that's been getting after teams with a fast-paced, wide-open offense for uh, four years now. And, and, and so you got Dylan Gabriel, even if that is the guy at quarterback who has shown he's a big-time player at a young age. I really think, given that this is sort of a Super Bowl opportunity for UCF, even with a down Stanford team, that this is a, I, I think that this could get ugly. I think UCF wins and wins handily. All right, wins, wins handily against a Power 5 opponent, which is what everyone points to for UCF, so that would really be a feather in their cap. 